What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Web3 DJs, your number one source for all things NFT, Web3, and crypto. We've got an awesome show in store for you guys today. Uh, before we get started, remember, if you enjoy this type of content, the best thing that you can do is tell a friend about it. Second best thing you can do, go to our YouTube, go to our Twitter, like, comment, and subscribe. And that, you know, we really appreciate your support. Um, so yeah, we're going to break down all things NFT NYC. We got our own personal jet setter there. So if you were like me and unable to attend, Hofstra is going to tell us everything that we missed out on. From there, we're going to highlight the top crypto news of the week, the things that everybody's talking about, uh, doodles onboarding new exec members to the Rider Rips Board Ape Yacht Club conundrum, right? Seems to be the right now. From there, we'll kind of end the show with telling you guys what we're doing in Web3, our strategy, what we're looking at buying, and how we're handling this market. Before we get started, though, don't forget, this is your last chance to enter the giveaway. If you are interested, we've got that sweet Web3 DJ merch, the first drop limited um, release, and we're going to be giving that away shortly after the show. So one last thing we do want to start doing is documenting where Ethereum is when we do these shows so quickly. At the time of recording, it seems like we got a little bit of a bounce back this week and ETH is back up around $1,200. So, you know, that's a positive sign. Who knows if it's the love from NFT NYC and you and all your buddies going out there doing their thing. But uh, yeah, we're hoping for the best there. So why don't you go ahead and break it down for us? Tell us what we missed. How was NFT NYC? I saw you, you know, I was following you on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, like I told you, I was living vicariously through you. Looked like a blast. I see you're rocking the merch. Go ahead and break it down for us. Dude, I am exhausted. Like, there was so much stuff going on. I wish I have. Let me see if I can find this. I had to I had to literally plan out each well, day of what was going on. Um, it, it was like almost system overload, to be honest. Like, there, I, I got, they circulated a Google Docs that had like 300 events on it. Well, you had to be strategic because depending on what event you wanted to go to, you would have to go to like Brooklyn or you'd have to go to Soho or you'd have to go over here. So you could only pick and choose a certain amount of things. I brought my daughter. She's 13. I wanted to expose her. Um, she's getting into NFTs. And so there was only some stuff that I could go to anything 21 and up. I couldn't. So like the gutter cats party, which looked badass, uh, the Adam bomb squad where they had, push a T. I didn't get to go to that. So, um, I missed out on the nightlife. Um, but even the stuff that I went into during the day was just awesome. Now, probably the biggest takeaway, I spent $1,200 on two tickets and this was three months before I went to five minutes of actual talks. Well, wow. in four days. Well, wow. so if that tells you anything, and I, and I don't think I, my experience was uh, different than others. Most people didn't go to the conference. In fact, I heard a lot of the speakers actually canceled because there was like 1500 speakers. And really what you went to the conference for was to meet all the people that were exhibiting all like a ton of projects, all the blockchains. So at the Marriott Marquis, it's huge. It's right in Times Square. There was nine floors that were basically taken up by NFT NYC Wow. people. So like they had a Tron, the blockchain Tron had a whole floor. Uh, Flow blockchain had a whole floor. And then on each one of those floors, there was exhibitors. And so I had to ship, I'm not even kidding, probably a box like this big of just, it cost me more to ship the stuff back from the conference. And, and, I, and I didn't even get everything. I just got like what I could get, but I have so many shirts and like cups and stuff like that. That was kind of cool. And then actually talking to each uh, of the projects that was there, having a little bit of one-on-one. -on -one. There was a lot of NFT projects that were exhibiting. Um, so the conference, I, I didn't get much from the conference, but the actual events were sweet. So mine started, I don't know if I could share my screen. I, I yes. pulled up my Twitter. Um, so like around like this, this picture right here, this was the first day I was there. There was tons of like board AP yacht club stuff all over new york now i didn't go to the ape fest because i'm not an ape holder but i mean you saw apes everywhere there was twenty thousand people ish there for the conference and oh so goodness. everyone was decked out in their nft gear and <clears throat> the groups of people were just 
kind of all over. So when you'd be walking down the street and someone would see your stuff, they'd be like, Hey, what's up? And all of a sudden you're following each other on Twitter, posting a picture that, that was, that was really cool. Um, so yeah, this was the first event I went to, which was the Adam bomb squad hundreds. It was the first day they dropped this guy right here is funny. I took a picture of him. <clears throat> if you look at his Twitter, uh, he's like a 100 time Grammy nominated producer. He was just standing in line with me. And then this other guy right oh. here, his buddy, and so that, that's kind of like the crowd you would be in where, you know, it'd be some normal guy and then some like huge exec from, you know, where, wherever. Um, yeah. These posters were all around. Like this is all the stuff I got that first day. They did a V friends collab. Um, this was the store. Uh, this was at the, um, the gutter cap gang. <clears throat> they had a, a collaboration with stadium goods and they had a block party so they had a dj and people playing basketball and the hoop a line, yeah around the corner so i got some you know some gear <laughs> from there um there's benjamin oh there's, nice that's yeah, awesome did you get to connect with him yeah he was there everybody was there it was cool um but that's they blocked off the whole street and they had a party almost all day and so if you were a holder you could get there two hours before everyone and get the merch um, this is some of the stuff that I got. I, I spent like $1,200 on merch, dude. It was absolutely bananas. Um, this right here was the Kryptoon Goons. Kryptoon Goons showed out, man. That, showed that, out. That team, top notch. I mean, they had the Urban Outfitters thing where they were making shirts for you. You got to, you got an NFT if you went. They had the whole area. All the goons were there. And then they had a soccer party on some like rooftop where they had painted it. Um, but everything was like free food. I got this hat. I got a Jersey that they put my name on the back with like patches. Then they had a yacht mm. party. I mean, that's just one project. So every project was doing stuff almost every single day. Like I didn't even go to the loser club stuff cause I couldn't get over there. But, um, what yeah. was your, uh, method of transportation? I saw like people posting triple digit Ubers and that sort of thing to get around. Was that the case or how, how did you navigate that? Yeah, man, it was just you either walked, you took a cab, you took an Uber, or you took the subway. I took the subway most places. I had to get used to, you know, figuring out where to go and, you know, not being from New York. It was kind of like a scavenger hunt to find these places. So you, you, you go down on the subway and then all of a sudden you're in some other part of town and you're trying to find a location on your Google Maps. But that's what made it fun. And I think I, I was listening to a podcast today and they were talking about how NFT NYC needs to figure out what they are. Are they a conference or is it like a party atmosphere? And it kind of feels like it's more of a party atmosphere because there was probably just as many people that went that weren't going to the conference mm -hmm. that just went to all the parties. And this is where the in real life NFT experience comes in because if, if you didn't have a party, it's almost like, are you really in nfts like if you're a substantial group and you didn't have something all the parties were there i'm not saying you don't have to but it's kind of like that experience alone of having all the people in the nft space being in one location getting to meet each other talking nfts that was like a you're coming out party um i don't know i mean i think it would be i'd be kind of upset if i was in a um in a project and they didn't have something going on where like you know, Krypton Goons has six things, you know, and you're not paying for anything. You just got to get there. So that was the cool thing. I mean, um, this picture right here, this was at the Nifty Portal. That's Eric Ebron right there. So we come outside and <laughs> they were all just smoking weed. And, uh, you know, this is a picture of us, just, you know, all of our shoes that, you know, everybody's True. collectors. So you got people into sneakers. Yeah. You got everyone wearing their gear. If you walked in with a hat like this, they were like, oh, did you go to that party? Did you do this? Like, you know, instantly there was that connection. But this was one of my favorite things to do at NFT NYC was the Nifty Portal Party because that's okay. the show I listen to every single morning and you don't know who these people are. So it was like a big Tinder date. Everyone's showing up. You don't know what you're going to get. And you're like, oh, shit, you're so-and-so. Oh, what's up? You know, and then you're taking pictures. And um, yeah, so this is this is day two, all the merch that I got. That's the Alien Friends jersey. That's Krypton Goons jersey. It's all the the stuff there. So um, the other cool thing is I met I met the Kumite people. And actually, this was one of the highlights of my trip. Um, I had bought a Kumite. It, so Kumite is um, the founder of Comic-Con started Kumite. 
But okay. I met all the people that were there and it's some pretty successful guys. A couple guys had some exits and some big companies and now this is their passion project. Nice. Anyway, he was like, yeah, we just revealed our thing. So I went home, I checked, you know, I, I pre refreshed the data and all of a sudden I had some super rare Kumite NFT and I asked him, hey, is this any good? And they were like, yeah, that's a good one. So I put it up for 1.5 ETH, sold it in like two seconds and then bought an eight, uh, bought a dead, dead fellas with it. Dang, so that was cool. Awesome. Yeah, they were talking about wanting to come on. And so I've, I've got, I don't know, I'd say between five and 10, I think solid projects um, that are willing to come on the show and talk NFT NYC. And that was the probably the best thing. If you're in Web3 space and you're trying to meet people, the networking was was where it was at. I mean, you're getting access to all the founders and, you know, you go to one party and there were usually like four other parties connected to that one party. So um, super cool. This is like a picture of the actual conference, just meeting, you know, different people there. Um, like I said, it was nine stories at the actual conference. It's wild. So, yeah, man, it was um, it was a good experience from last year to this year. It was magnitudes bigger. I, I don't know. It was five, 10 times bigger. Wow. There wasn't that many really? projects. Eight Fest was like the big thing last year and Gutter Cat had party, but it was very limited. This year there was like it, just so many things going on and every um, project, it was like Madonna was at a, at a party. Like the Dead Fellas project looked dope. Gutter Cats. I mean, I'm just rattling off the ones that I went to, but there was 300 other projects that I probably have never heard of that were people were just as excited to go to them. Were a lot of them kind of like exclusive? And if you weren't part of the project, you weren't able to get into the function? Or it was, was like it open to the public? Okay. Yeah. So if you were a holder of the projects, there was different access. And then yeah. some of them would allow you to go um, and check it out. And then they would close it down. And if you were a holder, you could get in later. So yeah. it was kind of a mix of both. But, um, you know, this is where the whole in real life application of what are these people doing to engage uh, the community members and to to give back. <clears throat> I think some were better than others. Some some of it I'm kind of sitting here going like, okay, so I own the project and then I have to pay for all this merch and then I had to fly to New York. So it's actually, I've spent more money now <laughs> going to these things than what I'm actually getting. You know what I mean? Like if you were an ape, you got ape coin and all this other stuff, you, you're way in the green. Right. But some of these right. other projects, it's costing me money to go. So yeah. I don't know if it's like how I feel about the in real life application. I think, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, it is also really interesting. I want to point out somebody I, I wish I could quote them. I don't remember who it was, but put out a tweet and it said, just want to call out the fact that the Super Bowl and Eight Fest had the same performers, you know, Snoop Dogg, Eminem. And it's pretty that's a big deal. You know, that's no uh, nothing to slouch at. And so I, I guess the other question I had is how did you verify that you were a member of the project? Was there just kind of like a bouncer posted up at the door and you just pull up your MetaMask or your wallet and say, Hey, look, you know, I've got such and such. And they let you in. Everything was different. Some people use token proof, which is some, it, it's an app that you actually connect and it verifies and you get a ticket. Um, other people just use like Eventbrite. Most of them were using Eventbrite. And so you would put in your wallet address and then you would RSVP. There was a lot of them that were free that you would just RSVP to and you didn't need anything. Like I went to a Cardano bowling party the first night and all you had to do is just sign up for it and they had rented out. Um, you know, that was cool. Like if you're not, if you've never been to New York and you're looking for like a New York experience, th that is what you would get at this because all the nightclubs, all the restaurants, like pretty much all the six spots in New York were basically rented by NFT projects. And a lot of people were like, wow, what are NFTs? Like, what is this? I went to the Invisible Friends um, party and they were giving out on the hour, every hour, free NFTs. So it was free. You could just go there and you got a ticket. And if you just stayed there, they were raffling off like Kith and um, Alien Friend. I mean, I'm sorry, Invisible Friend stuff. And so that was cool. They had a merch stand that was like co-sponsored by Shopify. So you could buy like a cool deck and all the merch was cool. But then if you were a holder, you got free stuff. I think they gave you free stuff. Oh, the Cool Cats. That actually was like probably one of the coolest 
things that I went to as far as like an ex exhibition where they had rented out this huge building and you walked in and you had to scan a QR code. Then you, they gave you a bracelet and then you'd hit the bracelet and then you went upstairs and then there was like all these events that you had to do and then you had to scan your bracelet and then you got points. And so my daughter got like 10,000 points and she was able to get like a pair of sweatpants, a thing, like she got like oh, four different wow. things when she walked out. So people were, were like just giving away a ton of stuff there. And um, like that was more of an immersive party. So that was really cool. I think to bring exposure to the NFT space, people that maybe were plus ones or just trying to check it out to understand what it was, you got a lot of eyes on projects during that week and hopefully you know a lot of news outlets um what i did notice this year was the level of people that were there like last year was kind of just it was so new yeah. that it hadn't really been mainstream i guess i didn't feel like it's even mainstream now but you had big projects big name um companies sending their execs there all the crypto projects like the amount of money and the the level of people that were interested in nfts was very clear this year it was like holy shit like people are taking this serious and this is a thing like this isn't going anywhere just seeing how many people are trying to get into this space that is great man you know at a time when the space needs it most right it really needs a revival um to you know keep everyone engaged and uh continue to throw out those wag me, we are all going to make it vibes. So were there any functions that you rolled up to that you kind of were like immediately, uh, this, this isn't for me, you know, I'm going to leave. Did you have anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like the Cardano party. Okay. I thought like they were going to, we were going to bowl and I just got there and they were like, just in the corner. It was funny. Like the, the guy to girl ratio, that's <laughs> probably like eight to two sure. out, of, out of 10 people. You're like eight guys, two girls. So that, there's all these memes going around about how there's no girls at these parties. Um, so what, uh, what else? What about, was there anything that you wanted to go to that, you know, you weren't able to get into or for whatever reason? Dude, there was so much that I would have wanted to go to. How about so, uh, the, the doodles? Didn't you take like a video of their line or something like that? Mm, no, but the doodles, they announced a pretty big, um, uh, you, you may have heard this. I don't know if I can pull up my screen right here, but this was announced while we were there. So Pharrell Williams is now the creative director for Doodles. So they pumped. Also, Doodles 2.0 came out, and so they have a like a second tier project now. Um, so they announced this kind of stuff here, and they also so Alex will okay Doodles. Uh, also unveiled plans for a new NFT collection at the event, which is Doodle 2. CEO Julian Hol Holguin, um, which I guess was the former president of Billboard, said that the new collection will be far larger than the original collection of 10,000 avatars. So you can now get into doodles. I think it's like two and a half wow. ETH right now. They also took investment money. Um, I know it doesn't it. say how much, but um, they've got, yeah, Alex Ohanian's VC firm, 776, undisclosed amount of funding. So that was announced there. CryptoPunks announced some stuff. Um, but yeah, man, there was so much stuff I would have loved to go to. But quite honestly, by the end of the day, with like the time difference and just walking so much and just being all over, I was beat by like 10 o'clock. Man, I don't know how some of these people were just ripping all night, every night because I was just beat. And like, dude, I got home and I, I just took a day off because it was just so much action all fucking day. But definitely worth it. If you have not I been to it. NFT NYC, I would strongly recommend going because you're right in the middle of everything. And there's a lot of stuff you can attend and you might not know about a project. The whole reason that I bought a Dead Fellas was when I was at VCon, they were exhibiting. And then I saw so many people with Dead Fellas stuff and just the vibe of everybody that I met and just seeing them at all these things. I'm like, man. Like this lady, Betty, talked at every single conference and then they had a ton of stuff going on. So um, that's just my perspective. I could be totally wrong. But when I see people that are getting promoted as like the industry leaders and they're at all of these events and then the community is there just, you know, super hyped. Um, 
that makes me want to buy the project. And so that's why I bought Dead Fellows. Nice. Yeah. Um, I will say that through NFT NYC, even though I didn't go, just watching the projects that I was in um, and that I'm interested in, uh, specifically the Cryptoon Goons and the Gutter Cat Gang, do their thing. It made me way more bullish on them. Uh, to your point, I think they both have outstanding teams. And yeah, I, I actually wound up purchasing another goon, a goon that I love forever. It's on my PFP right now, if you check it out, in lieu of that, just because I saw the way that they were shipping product fast, for la lack of a better phrase, you know, and everybody seemed to enjoy it. And here's the thing that, for whatever reason, took me a long time to realize in the space is I was looking at projects that I felt like everybody had to love. You know, and, and I thought that the only way a project could be successful is if they had millions of people who love them. But the thing is, these are 10,000 or less piece collections. You just kind of need a core small group to get behind you and you'll propel this thing, you know, as far as they're willing to take it. And so I think the goons really have that. The gutter cat gang absolutely has that. And uh, yeah, I think NFT NYC was great for me as a viewer. Um, and then a corpse ape fest but you know speaking of the apes there is a lot that's going on there right now uh, especially everyone i'm sure has heard about rider rips the board ape yacht club um and you know his own version of the board ape yacht club called rider rips board ape yacht club so what we're going to do today is break this down for you in three different segments the first thing that we're going to do is talk to you guys about who is rider rips right get a little background on him uh, then Hofstra is going to break down for you his claims against the Bored Apes and why he decided to create his own project. I don't know if you can call it a derivative. He certainly would not call it a derivative. So why he's created his own project. And then three, we'll talk to you about, okay, where does this lay now? Um, what's going on? The Apes just announced that they actually are engaging in a lawsuit. They filed a lawsuit against him. And so we'll break down exactly what that means, what the Apes' positions are, and what they hope to gain from it. Um so yeah, let, let's start by saying who is Ryder Rips. So you can see here, this is his page um, for the official Ryder Rips Board Ape Yacht Club page. So it's really interesting that it actually got to number one on OpenSea. I don't know if they've posted something about this, um, but it got to number one on OpenSea before it was taken down. And again, it, just like what we were talking about, only 4,100 people are following the account. You just need your core small group to bring it up. But Ryder Rips himself, he considers himself a creative, or he is a creative director, artist, funk. He, this was one of his first projects that he actually did with the Zegabon, the founder of Azuki. Um, and actually, you know, we'll get into this a little bit He's later, but it is really interesting. Yeah, they, he, he kind of had something similar happen to him there. Yep. Um, and so I, I found this great thread actually by Box Talks. So definitely have to give it the you know credit to Box Talks. Well, let's start at the beginning. You know who is Ryder Rips? Of course, you guys can check out his Wikipedia and you, you know go through all of that. I, I won't pull that page up for you. But uh, there were a couple of interesting things. First of all, he's not new to the industry nor to uh, the creator. If you check out his website, you can see he created art for quite some time. As a matter of fact, in 2016, he was folk, he was featured in Forbes. 30 under 30 and the art and style uh, portion of that magazine. And this was after his first solo exhibition came out called Ho. So he is prominent as a creator, as an artist. Um, another thing to take note of is that Ryder Rips is quite used to being in the limelight. You know, he's done things uh, with Vice and what he kind of considers himself as a conceptual artist. And as we go through this, you'll see kind of what he means by that. Um, he also has, he's no stranger to the limelight, like we said. For a while there, he was claiming that he designed the CIA's new website. And the CIA actually had to go as far as coming out and saying that that is not the case. He did not create their website design. So uh, at that point, he kind of considered himself a prankster. Um, I, I'm not really sure. You can form your own opinions on how you want to go about that but he was saying he created their website and the cia actually had to come out and say no we have no idea who this guy is he did not create this website now this one is a little interesting again we're calling it conceptual art but what he did is when living in new york he hired two sensual masseuses from craigslist he brought them to the new york ace hotel and he told them essentially create art you know create whatever you want to do he recorded the exchange, 
and then titled the project Art Poor. So um, that that's you know kind of interesting as well. Uh, Along those lines, he's no stranger to picking topics that surround controversy. Um, he also created a VR project, which was entitled, uh, I can't pronounce this, unfortunately, Divantari Shiavo, or Becoming a Slave. And when you put this VR headset on, essentially, you immerse yourself into essentially like an assembly line, and you were a factory worker. And he um, tried to draw parallels between working in a factory and being a slave and you weren't able to escape. And so again, that's really interesting. Now this is the piece we were referencing earlier. The board apes did file a lawsuit against him, but he is to some degree, no stranger to this. So in 2021, this, according to box talks, writer rips placed himself in NFT history because he won a DMCA takedown over Larva labs. And what that means is Larva labs essentially looked at his project that he did with Zagabon called funks and said this is way too similar to our project essentially you stole our art and they tried to file this dmca where he would have to take down the project and writer rips despite having uh such close parallels between his funks and the crypto punks he actually won this lawsuit and was able to keep his project up they uh called this they said he was the first person to receive a dmca takedown regarding nfts and in lieu of that, the first one to really challenge IP rights in the space. Um, and again, here's a, a better definition of the DMCA takedown. It's when content is removed from a website or internet platform at the request of the owner of the content. Um, and so again, that is due to his early involvement with the funks. Um, and so from there, you know, things have kind of he's continued to be a player in the nft space he's really popular for of course you know having an ape and the things that he's done and now uh hofstra is going to break down to you kind of the the second piece here we told you who Ryder rips is gave him gave you guys a little bit of a background of who he was in the space and now hofstra is going to tell you about what's going on with his new Ryder rips board api club and why he has decided to you know go this route Okay, so if you go on his Twitter page, this website is linked. Yeah. And I won't go over this uh, a lot because you kind of touched on some of it. Um, but basically, uh, RRBAYC uses satire and appropriation to protest and educate people regarding the Board API Club and the framework of NFTs. The work is an extension of and is the spirit of other artists who have worked within the field of appropriation art. So, if you right at the bottom of this, um, there's another link you can go to, but basically here are the claims. And I went through it and I'm like, I mean, he's got, <laughs> he's got some points. I mean, to me, it's like super outlandish that like, I, I mean, I have a hard time just imagining these people sat down and they really, you know, were Nazis and created this project, you know, for, uh, anti-semitism and and racist ideology like it just seems crazy especially if you look at who all owns these things that someone would go to that link to do it but he draws a lot of correlations in here um and i guess it's not new that people have been talking about this project potentially being racist and if you you can read through this right here and we'll link to this on our um on our description. Right. Yeah. But if you go right here, here's all the tweets and I haven't pulled up of all the people talking about, you know, those NFT monkeys are racist somehow. No, I, I will not explain. I mean, there's celebrities on here, basically, you know, he builds a really strong argument. And so I guess if you're going to come sue him, he's, he's able to back a lot of this stuff up. I don't, I mean, when you sue somebody, I don't know what, like, it's going to cost a lot of money one to litigate but you have to sure. prove, prove financial harm of some sort. And you have to put a dollar amount. He's already done three and a half million dollars in sales on this project. And like you said, it was number one. So he's raised enough money to fight a lawsuit if he was smart with it. Right. Um, and so I'll just keep going down this right here. So one, Board Ape Yacht Club logo looks very similar to the Nazi token proof emblem. So you can look at this and you can look at that. Some similarities. The project was launched by a company called Yuga Labs. Um, the Kali Yuga is a popular element of alt-right traditional ideology and Yuga Labs has gone to 
to the effort to embed the traditional philosopher's name, Rene Gunion, uh, I'm saying that wrong, who is credited as being Yali Yuga into Western thought um, and an all right icon inside um, one of their puzzles also embedded. Um, so, I mean, you can see this, these pictures right here. Um, one of the co-founders goes by Gargamel, a character from the Smurfs who was acknowledged as an anti-Semitic uh, depiction of Jewish person, also a common term used on 4chan to discuss Jews. Uh, since I've brought this up, um, he has gone through the effort to try and hide it. Gargamel's real name, Greg Solano, a writer who wrote his undergraduate thesis on fiction about Nazis and expressed interest in incorporating a character like Hans Reiter, SS officer, into his writing. Wow. So that's a picture of Gargamel. That's the picture. Another co-founder, Emperor Tomato Ketchup, has the same name as an explicit film from 1971 that features scenes of a boy in a fascist uniform raping an adult bride. The original film is banned in the US and other countries on the grounds of child pornography. Here's a site to that. Um, I don't know, I mean, I can go through all of these, but there's some pretty strong correlation. I mean, if you look at this stuff and what he's putting, I mean, <laughs> it, it, the guy's got an argument. Um, has it affected the floor price? Absolutely not. Does Yuga Labs have way more money than this guy to stretch a lawsuit out for as long as they want? Absolutely. So I don't know, like my personal take on it, and I know people that have apes, most of them kind of just aren't paying attention to this. Um, but he has a history of trying to do things that are going to grab attention. Um, and he's figured Absolutely. out how to do that. And so... It'll be interesting to see how this thing plays out. But if you have some time, go through and read through this. And I think you'll go, well, guy's got a point. He draws some pretty good examples here. Um, I don't know. To me, you're going to have to draw your own conclusion. It, it seems a bit far-fetched, um, especially with the money going behind it and you know who's involved in the project, that if it was truly like a racist like a, a cons conspiracy where these guys got together and they, you know, want to create, I mean, first of all, like who was thinking this project's going to blow up a year and a half ago. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I think 100% to your point, this is, we always say, do your own research. Uh, this is definitely a time to do your own research. I was telling you before the show though, what's really interesting about this is I had seen these claims months ago. I don't know if it was Ryder Rips who put them out, but this is the second wave for me of seeing this uh, correlation between the Board API Club and these uh, anti-Semitism groups. So I think that in itself is a little interesting to me. Um, I also did want to comment that Yuga Labs, you know, they're a billion dollar company and he's done 3.5 to $5 million in sales. So there's definitely a big difference there between the two. Uh, on top of that, I will say what is interesting is, as I understand it, there have actually been a lot of bored apes who have bought his project. So I think that that piece is really interesting. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to see what the future holds. And so speaking of the future, we found another great thread here that will break down. And it, it really kind of we will give you the too long didn't read version, but basically this gentleman named Ibnul Khan, uh, again, uh, apologies if I didn't pronounce that correctly. He broke down exactly what's going on. So the board apes filed a lawsuit claims in lieu of uh, essentially what they're calling copyright infringement. And Ryder Rip's position is how can this be copyright infringement when the very core of NFTs is they cannot be copied, a non-fungible token. So despite the art being the exact same, and let's be clear here, token for token, the art is the exact same as the Board API Club. His comments are, they're both non-fungible tokens. So at their core, they can't be copied. And so that's a really interesting position. So we'll go ahead and break this down for you. So first part of the thread, again, the, the lawsuit was filed in federal court in California, basically saying that Ryder Rips and those acting with Ryder Rips are misusing Yuga Labs trademarks. Um, and devaluing Board API Club, falsely accusing racism. 
Yuga Labs is bringing this action and they say they're bringing this action because they don't want any confusion in the marketplace. Basically, they don't want people thinking they're buying a real Board Ape Yacht Club, but they're actually purchasing one of Ryder Rip's Board Ape Yacht Club. And also, you know, there's a pride thing. They want to protect their image, all of that sort of thing as well. So what legal theories is Yuga pursuing? So what they're doing is they are trying to get injunctive relief and damages um, under a false ad and cyber squatting law. They're also saying that there's unfair competition and false advertising under there's trademark infringement, unjust enrichment of writer rips through literally using their products, um, conversion and tortious interference. So we go a little further and say, okay, who are they trying to hit with this? So there are two separate parties of defendants. Um, the first parties are writer rips, Jeremy Kahn, and um, anybody who's kind of like the dev team of Ryder Rips Board API Club, and that's who they're trying to hit first. Now, there is a second group that they are suing, and this is where it's really important for you guys as our listeners. They are suing individuals and entities who are working to knowingly perpetuate and promote and sell Ryder Rips Board API Yacht Club NFTs, which is including those who knowingly buy and resell the Rider Rips Board Ape Yacht Club. So if you are someone who's purchasing and selling these, you are actually now included in this lawsuit. And, it, and as we go down the thread, we'll see that Yuga Labs is going to try and identify those people. So uh, that I think is really important. I mean, who knows? You know, initially I would say, how can they just sue a consumer? But they are going to try and do that. So you, you should be very aware of that situation. Um, and yeah, as a fact, as a matter of fact, this guy, Ibnul Khan, go ahead, he highlights that again and emphasizes the point. Yuga will seek to discover who the IDs of these defendants are, the second group of defendants, name them as a party for knowingly perpetuating the promotion and sale, again, including those who are buying and reselling them knowingly. So to some degree, if you bought it thinking, oh my goodness, I've heard about Board API Club and they're on sale, look at this floor price, and you bought it and you didn't really understand that what it was the Rider Rips variation, you might be able to get away with it. But if you know what Rider Rips' goal and mission is and you buy into his project and you resell it, uh, allegedly you will be named here as a the second group of defendants in that party. So that I think is quite interesting and very important to bring to light. Now, here, here's kind of some of the facts and we'll go through these quickly. Facts, Yuga Labs created Board API Club on Ethereum 2021. They sold licenses for users to mint the Board API cluster 0.08 Ethereum, which is 170 to 230 bucks at the time. There's 10,000 Board API clubs um, and holders have certain commercial rights, benefits and opportunities. Okay, nothing new there. Now, of course, Board API Club has generated massive public interest. It talks about how it has most recently been included in Rolling Stone Magazine, CNET, Wired, New York Times. 101 were auctioned last year for $24.4 million. Christie's sold a collection, which included four Board API Clubs for $12 million. And one Board API Club in itself sold for $3.4 million. And here's where we got that. Wow, I said Yuga's worth was $1 billion. This guy is suggesting that Yuga's worth is about $4 billion. So excuse me. So again, $4 billion versus $5 million in sales for Rider Rips. There's quite a bit of a difference there. Valuation. Uh, yeah, ab ab valuation. Sure, absolutely. Um, so yeah, they've worked with major celebrities. Of course, we all know Jimmy Fallon, Justin Bieber, Madonna, Snoop Dogg, Eminem, Steph Curry, Serena Williams, Shaq, uh, major brands such as Adidas, Universal Music Group, and Arizona Ice-T. Here's kind of all the pending trademark applications for Yuga Labs. That's Board Ape Yacht Club, B-A-Y-C, Board Ape, Ape, their logo, and then the Ape Skull logo. Okay, and so that's important because if you look at the Rider Rips page, like Hofstra was showing us earlier, a lot of these are just copied on just with rr at the front of them um now yuga is alleging that the defendants infringe on the board ape yacht club marks they use the very same marks to promote their rider rips board ape yacht club um on the same marketplaces at that which yuga sells board ape yacht club um and if we pull this up here you can see like we talked about on one side is the Board Ape Yacht Club, 
And on this side is the Rider Rep Sport Ape Yacht Club. The same exact token, and it's the same exact ape. Now, as we kind of go through, and we'll, we don't have to go into all of this, but um, this gentleman lines out some more examples of their infringement, including the website rrboardapeyachtclub.com, which Hofstra was showing us earlier, and it uses the Board Ape Yacht Club trademark in the title of the page. Um, it uses... Rider Rips is using their Ape Skull logo. He also sought to use OpenSea. So Rider Rips was actually, after going to number one on OpenSea, they were taken down. They were also taken off of X2, Y2, uh, and looks rare in lieu of this situation. Um, and then they actually wound up going to use the Foundation NFT Marketplace. And what happened there is it wound up causing confusion on Google. So people were Googling Board Ape Yacht Club, attempting to see what's going on, navigating to this page and thinking that they're getting a discount. And so that, that's part of where Yuga Labs and the Board Ape Yacht Club is coming from. Um, they even go as far to say that whenever somebody hovered over the Rider Rips Board Ape Yacht Club, the Board Ape Yacht Club logo was shown very small. And you can see right there how tiny that was. Um, and so, again, that, that contains Board Ape Yacht Club marks there. Now, this I thought was really interesting. We always say if you need to some verification or something, check out your Ether scan or check out Ether scan. So what Ryder Rips did is to his contract address on this, on Ether scan, he changed the tracker down here at the bottom to say Board Ape Yacht Club, not Ryder Rips Board Ape Yacht Club. He explicitly changed it to say Board Ape Yacht Club. So people were then navigating to the contract address, uh, minting or purchasing in lieu of that. And again, you know, thinking that they may be purchasing something that's authentic and legit, and it was not. Um, and again, th there's that is significant because the token tracker is how you validate the authenticity of an NFT, just like Ibnul has outlined here. They also, Yuga is alleging that in lieu of this, people will be confused, just like we talked about here. Now, he goes into much more detail than we're highlighting for you guys here. We just kind of wanted to hit a too long, didn't read version of this. Um, but again, Ryder Rips campaign has made $5 million using Yuga Labs trademarks at the expense of Yuga and its community. Um, they are, Yuga saying that Ryder Rips claims are widely discredited. And uh, they are also saying that they feel harassed and attacked, uh, especially the founders, through accusations of racism, which, I mean, any of us would feel that same exact way. So long but, story but this isn't as much about the racist comments as it is about trademark infringement is what it sounds like. Yep. Absolutely. Or, or not trade trademark infringement, but like using cool. their their pictures right? Like the most right. of what you just read was not about being racist. Well, and here, here's what it basically comes down to is like, they decided if they're going to do a lawsuit, they're going to put every single thing that they can into it. Right. You know? And so it, I think they're, it, they're trying to like, when you go fishing, you put out as many lines as you can hope that you get one fish, right? They're trying to hope that something hits it for some reason. Um, like writer rip is claiming you can't actually copy an NFT. And that is, the court's decision, even though the, the Board of Yacht Club is calling for a jury trial, by the way, let's make sure that we're, we're clear there. Um, but if that's the jury, Did you want a jury trial, that seems like a slippery slope. Agreed. Um, if he has some validation, like I've gone through a lawsuit, I, I went through a pretty extensive one with my company and one, it, it is not cheap. So it's going to take a lot of money. Right. Two, it's based on what you can prove. So before you can even get to a jury trial, you have to present evidence to say there's enough here to even make the lawsuit go forward. So they have to go through discovery. Then they start hiring people. And what they'll do is they'll hire lawyers to dig into his past and they'll try to make him look like the bad guy. And that's just a tactic that lawyers do. So they're going to look at everything he's done in the past. They're going to try to discredit him. They're going to try to do all these things, rightfully so. And I don't think, I mean, there's so much that's still unknown in NFTs now. Right. Like, especially there's not a precedent on any of this stuff. So yeah. you're really going to have a precedent get set based on this. I mean, it could go one of two ways. So absolutely. my 1% of lawsuits actually make it to a jury trial. Sure. You're, you'll go through three or four mediations before you get to a jury trial. My guess is this settles. 
They tell him to take all his stuff down. They probably make sure that he can't do anything. And he gets a lot of publicity out of the whole deal. And, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, we'll go ahead and uh, close this segment with this. What is Yuga Lag seeking? They're seeking the injunction for infringing on their trademarks. Proof of compliance with the injunction. Okay. They are ordering him to destroy and show proof of his destruction of the collection. They want him there uh, to withdraw applications for Board Ape Yacht Club trademarks, judgments for and attorney fees. So they're hoping that he's going to win attorney fees and then enhance damages. On top of that, what would be the damages here? They're trying to take all of his profits that he's made. So that's that $5 million. Um, and then, you know, plus whatever else they can prove. But yeah, alleged, and, and this will be easy to prove to Ibnul's point here due to the blockchain, right? It's all out there on the blockchain. We'll be able to see exactly how much he's made from this. And so he's hoping to get, uh, the Board Ape Yacht Club is hoping to not only make him take everything down, but take all the profits with him. Now, this guy is a trial lawyer in New York and Maryland, the individual who wrote this thread. So we'd also love to have you on their show and, you know, break this down for us yourself. But basically what he's saying is, under trademark fair use claim, he thinks Ryder Rips does have a defense. but That's probably, what I'm thinking. Yeah, but probably not a winner because they are explicitly using Yuga's trademarks in a right. marketing uh, competing project. Um, he says Yuga's represented by a great IP firm. You know, of course, a $4 billion valuated company. He says it seems like a textbook trademark infringement case. Parties will probably settle after burning through some cash. If not, he thinks Yuga wins the injunction, so the order to take things down, as well as damages based on the defendant's profits and harm to Yuga, plus attorney fees. So he he does think that Yuga Labs will wind up winning this. Um, I'm no lawyer or anything like that. Hey, I took a business law class in high school. Honestly, what it comes down to for me is I think Yuga Labs has more money, can hire better lawyers, and I think we've seen this play out time and time again in the judicial system. Um, so I think Yuga will win this as well. Well, what do they say? Any news is, or any press is good press. This guy definitely, we're, we're talking about him on a YouTube show. He's getting a lot of people who is asking who is right or rips and he's making noise. So, I mean, it, it's right in line with this, with this past, but, um, in the big scheme of things, didn't change anything on board API clubs floor price. So I think largely people are going, yeah, whatever, at least from what I've heard. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, any press is good press. He's the hottest topic right now in the NFT space, which is crazy because it's being followed up just like that by NFT. And it's interesting that it seemed like a lot of these allegations surfaced right around the time that 8Fest was happening in NFT NYC. And so, you know, there was kind of, so Nothing was on accident. We'll say that, right? You know, he was strategic with every single piece of this, I believe. Yeah. I mean, it, this is not new for artists doing this stuff. Artists come up with schemes of, you know, how to get their name out there and uh, do all kinds of stuff. So this is not, it's not a new thing. It's maybe new in NFTs, but I suspect you're going to have more of this down the road. You're going to have more lawsuits. You're going to have, because there's not a lot of stuff established yet on what is right and what's wrong and people are kind of doing whatever they want and it's going to take some of these things to actually set the rules in what you can and cannot do it's still kind of the wild west but as they say the the gears of justice grind slow but they so, grind so if you're doing stuff that's illegal it may you may be getting away with it now but again everything's verified on the blockchain you can go back five years or sometimes even longer than that and so just because you're doing something, getting away with it right now, or, or it's the Wild West, does not mean that, you know, they can't come after you. I don't know if you saw the Wolf of, of Wall Street Full Send podcast, absolutely, where he's like, fraud is fraud. It yep. doesn't matter if it's legal or not legal. Fraud is fraud. If you're doing something wrong, you're going to get in trouble for it. So um, ultimately, I think it'll be a good thing to get some of this stuff hashed out. But it's actually a good segue into... So I have Jim pulled up right now. Oh yeah, let me um, I don't know if if any anybody on here has used Gem. So it's a it's an aggregator. So basically, if you wanted to list a, let me see, if you wanted to list a project, um, 
and I will say, while he's doing this, uh, he, you know, got on there and told me about it. And ever since, this has been one of the first tools that I go to when I'm looking at floors and looking to buy or sell something, for sure. So what you'll see is RR Board Ape Yacht Club. It's number one on here. So if you click on this, each of these logos tells you where it's selling. There's only one site it looks like. Oh, no, it's on Looks Rare. Looks I Rare, rare is selling them. Put back and on. X2Y2 is selling them. Um, but one thing that you want to be really careful about, and I learned this when I bought my dead fellas. So I'll just I'll just go back to the main page and pull this up. Let's just go to uh, mutant. Oops. Let's go to mutants right here. And like this one's at 16.8. And I'm just guessing based on what I've looked at, if it's really see this little reported for suspicious activity on OpenSea. So you can buy this but you cannot sell it on OpenSea, which also doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So it's like, if someone steals my NFTs, as long as I can't, I mean, I can't sell it on OpenSea, but I could go on Gem and I can sell it on LooksRare and X2Y2. What prohibits me from selling, you know? Um, and this is what happened to me on my dead fellas. I bought a dead fella and I was like, oh, wow, it's like, you know, a half an ETH cheaper. And I, I asked my buddy, hey, is this legit? Yeah, yeah, it's legit. And then I bought it. I go to open it up on OpenSea and it says it's stolen. So I'm like, shit. So I just went, I didn't want to have someone stolen NFT. I actually took a loss on it. I put it back up and I sold it back on here. But my point is you can still sell stolen NFTs. Everything yeah. we talked about, it was taken off of uh, OpenSea, but you can go right here. You can buy one right now. Um, but it's, I don't know, the, on the positive side here is if you wanted to list on three different websites, X2Y2, Looks Rare, and OpenSea, you can list at the same time um, going on here. So if you just went, you know, let's say sell, and I wanted to sell, see. let's say this Atom Bomb Squad that I have, right? Proceed the list. I could go, um, let's say point, I'll just say 0.68, okay? Do the same thing here. Boom. And Dude, what if it gets sold? Well, then it sells, and then I buy another one. Oh, what's the uh, floor at? 0.42. Oh, okay. okay. I pay 0.5 for it. So I was about to slide in right quick and oh, got a new floor. Check it out. So now I'm listing on Looks Rare and I'm listing on X2Y2. I don't know why it's not listing on OpenSea. You That's probably weird. stole it. <laughs> no, it's not stolen. Anyway, just a pro tip and also something to look out for. I just thought that that was interesting. Um, outside of that, man, um, is there anything else you want to chat about? I mean, that was a pretty good rundown on. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Our, our Board Ape Yacht Club. Um, always want to thank everybody for coming in and, you know, joining the show. We always appreciate the support. Again, we're going to post the winner to the sick merch giveaway right after this. Before we go. It's Sunday, so I've only got a couple hours left. Let's go ahead and run through the old Tasty Bones portal, see if I can win anything here. We'll do this one quickly. Uh, any of these graves look good to you, Hofstra? Mm, that one right there. This one right here. Yeah. Consider it done. Let's see what I wound up with. Uh, oh, that does look pretty sweet. Proceed. Dang, look at that. That is something that's cool about um, Tasty Bones and something that I know a lot of projects are looking into now is this dynamic trait swap i mean imagine if you could buy outfits or buy skins for any project that you're in and nice oh, i got some waffles too and you know swap them out based on how you're feeling just like you would any other outfit um so what i'm gonna go do now is go back here we will check out the app run to the giveaways Connect my MetaMask. And let's see if I'm eligible for anything. Not eligible. Ended. Not eligible. All right. Well, it doesn't look like I want anything today, but you guys get the concept. Really cool. They've got all sorts of different giveaways going on here. And me, for someone who's into gambling and that sort of thing, this is right up my alley. So maybe next week we'll win. But uh, otherwise, yeah. As always, we're the Web3 DJs. We love having you guys here with us. We appreciate the support. If you enjoy the content, the number one thing you can do is like, comment, and subscribe. 
and then tell a friend about us. So we've got a big show also this Wednesday with Grant Flannery. Um, I, I should have had his information pulled up, but it's going to be an awesome show. Um, big Gutter Cat Gang supporter. So that's how we made this connection. Really appreciate him coming on. So that'll be this Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, and 6 p.m. What are you, Mountain? Yep. And then I guess that's 5 p.m. Pacific. So uh, until next time, I'm Sticky Finger Jones. This is Hofstra. Thanks for tuning we'll in. Stay, we got some bangers coming after that, too. So definitely bangers coming after that. Absolutely. Some great shows lined up for you all. So continue to support, and uh, we'll see you next time.